Hello and welcome to this uh, GigaOM um, webinar where we will discuss deception technology. We'll separate the facts from fiction and go through why it's no longer just a nice to have uh, with our sponsor, Elusive. Um, so for our talk today, a bit of background quickly, just from our from the two folks who will be talking. And um, my name is Simon Gibson. I spent a bunch of years working on internet technology at early AOL, uh, specifically streaming media and uh, some of the security challenges around that. I spent time at VeriSign working on .com and .net. I was the operating CISO at Bloomberg in New York for about five or six years. I went to a company called Gigamon that was a network packet broker where we did work uh, looking at network topology and packets. And now I am fortunate to be the analyst at Gigaom. And with me, I have Wade Lance from Elusive. Wade? Yeah, hello, Simon. Wade Lance. I'm the field CTO at Elusive Networks. Um, I started my experience in the deception space with Neural IQ. And we had a product called Event Horizon. Did a lot of work in the DC area with three-letter agencies. It's a very revealing introduction to the deception space. Uh, uh, again, at Calvio, spent about a year with them um, in the deception space. And then back now, again, at Elusive Networks. And so it's been a, it's been a long uh, career in the deception space. Very, very interesting transition over the last decade or so. Um, thanks for having me, Simon. Yeah, Wade, definitely. I'm, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. I think this will be an interesting conversation. Um, so what we'll go through today, just in by way of agenda, uh, we'll go for a bit about a history of the space and kind of talk about some of the evolution um, and maybe a little bit about um, just sort of the origin and the evolution, um, the parts that make it so compelling, uh, some of the topology things. Uh, you know, why is it challenging? Uh, specifically, how is it deployed and used? Uh, we'll do a, a look at Elusive and we'll have some takeaways followed by hopefully some questions and answers from you. Uh, if you have questions or answers, don't hesitate to type them in. Uh, at, certainly at the end, we will get, get through to them. Um, and then uh, I think we'll, we'll kind of, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens from there. Oh, and we have a poll as well. So wait, let's get into the history of the space because I think this is, um, this for me is certainly is, is interesting. I always like to know where, where, um, where these things sort of evolved from and started from. Uh, so maybe, uh, yeah, let's go through and talk a little bit about how this evolved. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's you know, it's funny. The deception space has been around for you know, well over a couple of decades, um, you know, actually going back into the you know, early 1990s. And there's a fabulous book out there for people that want to go all the way back. It's called um, The Cuckoo's Egg. And it's just a fascinating study of, of an initial deception campaign. And of course, deception is is not new to to uh, j just cybersecurity, right? It's been around in a lot of in a lot of different uh, in a lot of different um, arenas. Obviously, the military has used it in commercial as well. So, but the honeypot space and the deception space really, I think, has gone through uh, a lot of of you know two steps forward and three steps back as people have attempted to operationalize it. Um, we got some of the old you know some of the old history old history here and people can go back. It's interesting. I think Symantec has had three different deception products over the years. Um, and what's so fascinating about the study is that there's always been in cybersecurity this idea that deception could fundamentally change the cybersecurity practice because of some really distinct advantages that deception has. And yet operationalizing that on a broad scale has been super difficult. So we've seen a lot of, you know, new commercial entities with a deception product in the space get all excited about it and then and then the adoption just kind of kind of hasn't been there so um i it, it's funny we think about the history of the deception space one of the most amazing plays in the deception space that's been successful is say the movement by fireeye to develop an automated uh platform for binary uh, execution in a in a fake environment and the value that people have gotten out of that. So it's it's really been a constantly evolving uh, evolving space, struggling though with broad adoption. Yeah, for for me for sure, the how do I actually deploy and use it? You know, from the early days, I remember either you know 
team members, other people I worked with, you know, or, or even, you know, as a group effort, setting up honeypots. And, and, you know, in theory, it was a great idea because you set it up and nothing ever touches it. And if anything does, there's a problem. And, and so you, you really, it's this low touch kind of thing. But what, you know, we found was it was a, just a machine that needed care and feeding and that, you know, it, it almost never sounded an alert for us. Um, and it gets to be one of those things where if you have 500 different alert types and event types and things you're correlating, the thing that doesn't beep at you in a few months, you and if it drops offline or something happens to it, you may not be, you know, even watching it anymore. I mean, it was just, it was one of those things where I found that the oper operationalizing aspects of this were were really really difficult the you know in theory i thought it was a great concept um but but the operational operationalizing of it was was tough and it's it's interesting you know how long uh it's actually been along uh, i mean it's this is you know sort of it, it, it's a you know 1990 1997 you know sort of big milestones to 2002 and i think that's right around the time i remember working with it um slide Thank you. So I think, um, you know, one of the things when I think about a honeypot, like I said, my, my experience was simply build a machine, put, you know, the, the, the sort of software where somebody, if somebody scans it, connects to it, does something to it, attempts to, to in any way, you know, interact with this host alert. Um, it's come a long way, right? I mean, and I think that it would be, you know, beneficial to those listening. I think we should go through kind of the, the main, you know, the main pieces for deception. Yeah, Wade? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> you know, the compelling idea behind deception has always been, you know, kind of the list, you know, we're looking at here, right? Um, this, you know, what's unique about the deception method, um, there we go, what's, what's unique about the deception method is a way to present a story to an attacker that that drags them out of uh, and their their existing methodology and gets them to kind of really reveal their behavior, right? And so um, the different elements, you know, we're looking at, we, you know, we, we're, we're definitely looking for very few false positives. And that's, you know, that's hard to come up with, right? The scanning systems are always trying to reach out and enumerate our our deceptions that we put we put in the space. Um, so that that creates a difficulty um, to actually achieve a low false positive rate. Uh, breadcrumbing and lures, right? We a lot of deception has been focused on honey pots, and so there's been this strong effort to try and deploy data onto uh, production systems in the forms of breadcrumbs and lures that really point people at um, the honey pots in order to get good detection and that's hard to do right good yeah. breadcrumbing is extremely hard to do and to make it uh to make it effective yeah um, i mean i think that's a good one for people listening who are maybe not super familiar with it i mean it's a pretty interesting concept where you drop um you know fake browser history registry entries usernames stuff that a normal user would not interact with but that would point an attacker who dumped the registry or is looking at you know uh password space and memory um you know to point them to a phony domain controller or to a phony server or a decoy server rather and um i mean i think that's an interesting concept do you did have, was that sort of do you know the origin of that or can you talk to us a little bit about it just to make sure that anybody listening kind of understands you know when we talk about breadcrumbs and lures what that means sure sure so you know, we back in the day, right? We built these fabulous honey pots, and you know, we made them as interesting as we could. And then we realized there were some deficiencies in kind of standalone systems, and so we expanded out to honey nets. Right now, we've got groups of systems um, that are designed to uh, reveal attackers. The difficulty comes that you know, attackers. You know, when I land on a beachhead, maybe I'm an insider. Um, and I, you know, and you gave me a beachhead, right? My laptop is a beachhead or, or mm -hmm. I'm an external threat actor and I, I, I get a, you know, gain a foothold in the environment. If I'm looking at production systems and I don't see any pathways to the, uh, the, the decoy hosts um, and your honeypots, well then how do I find them? I mean, back in the old day, we could rely on a little bit of scanning, right? We would trust a, an attacker to, to get on a beachhead maybe do a little end map scanning and kind of look around. But you know, today um, and for a, a while now, um, you know, most organizations have pretty good scanning detection capability. And if you start if you start running NMAP scans through sub networks, you're you're going to be detected. So 
Um, what we started to do in the industry was to deploy fake history onto production assets, right? Workstations and servers. We deploy history to those systems so that there were these breadcrumbs that would point you towards our honeypots. But we had to do it in a way that wouldn't trip up the uh, traditional user. I remember in a particular deception campaign, we had done some SMB shares on a honeypot and were very excited um, to actually create some mapping to those systems uh, shared drive from the production host. So anybody that went down into NetView and really dug down into the into the guts would find these connections. Um, well, what happened was a, a, an actual operator was, you know, part of his job was looking at network communications and he noticed he had this kind of hidden network share he was attached to and in a secured environment started saving and offloading sensitive data off of his systems onto this network share that he had found, you know, good news. And so then he went and got a buddy of his and said, hey, have you got access to that new network drive? There's a ton of space over there where you can, you know, you can store your data. So, you know, sensitive information starts being moved over to the honeypots. And it was, it was, you know, not a, not a happy day uh, in that yeah. campaign. So, so this becomes that tension and sensitivity in, in doing good deception. How do I leave traces and breadcrumbs that point people at the deceptive environment, whatever that may be, and yet do that in a way that the normal user won't stumble across them and will actually uh, you know, create false positives and, and worse, mess up user operations. Yeah, I mean, to me, that was a big one. The fact that it's agentless, but you, you still, I mean, I think it's important to clear up for, again, for people listening, there's no agent running on an endpoint, which is really nice, but you do connect to the endpoint to update the registry and poke these things into memory and leave these sort of, sort of invisible footprints that point an attacker to a honeypot. Like your example of that SMB was initially when I first considered this technology, my main concern was, you know, we already have a network running. And we have people trying to run this network and it's, I don't want to say it's barely running, but it is a lot of work to keep this network running. And now we're going to put a bunch of, you know, quote unquote, you know, decoy systems or systems that are meant to be scanned, poked, and are effectively from an administrative workflow perspective broken. There are systems that, you know, that make my network more confusing. And now as a network administrator, I have to deal with my already complicated moving network and a whole pile of decoys. And I think what was illuminating to me as we went through the GigaOM paper about uh, deception technology, just how far along it's come to the point where you know the honey nets as you said the, the 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 deception decoys and breadcrumbs and how they're deployed in an agentless state uh actually don't really get in the way of operations and in fact you know with things like whitelisting a scanning machine so for example if your network has a qualis and you do a regular scan on your network you can whitelist your scanner ips and there's ways to kind of manage this this infrastructure now which is i think that's a really important differentiation is that it's not just a box running a honey net or a honey pot. It is a full sort of, it's almost like it's an inverted command and control infrastructure, right? Yeah, and that's, and I think you brought this point up earlier, Simon, and it, and it bears it bears repeating. Look, you know, security teams don't have any time for a, hardly anything, right? I mean, these are just really, really busy operators. And so, mm -hmm. To come in and suggest that we're going to bring in a deception technology that's going to that's going to require a bunch of work is just a non-starter, right? And or or even for not just security teams, but for IT operational teams, right? Uh -huh. I mean, you just, you just can't be getting in people's way. So this has been, I think, the the huge advancement in the deception the deception space uh, within the last you know five six years is the automation of the infrastructure. Um, in such a way as to meet both the requirement for deception to be, to look real and to be believable and to be fresh. It's gotta be updated almost constantly based mm -hmm. on how users behave. Um, and yet do, do it in a way that doesn't impede operations and doesn't tip off the hand, to, you know, your hand to the attacker. If, if you use an agent on people's systems, you know, they just, they just generally hate that in the first place because of mm -hmm. the overhead, but it also gives an attacker an advantage. If I can identify your agent uh, or a running process, then um, A, I can attack it, or B, I, you know, now that I'm aware of what you're doing, I can, I can avoid a lot of your actions. Yeah, so, sure. 
you know, the agentless approach is a is a huge uh, advancement in this space. And then and then so I, another thing that I found illuminating as we were going through the the research for this, the you know the ways to deploy this to get the servers online, which you know I think for the most part. Um, they're, they're either VM servers or, you know, what, what exactly, talk to me a little bit about the decoy servers in the L2 and how that sort of technology, not necessarily deploys, but just the sort of high level state of it. Yeah. So, you know, modern, you know, modern networking gives us a lot of, a lot of advantages. And, and one of the things that we want to do is to take advantage of, you know, network taps to, to broad numbers of VLANs um, as well as, you uh, you know the option to do software defined networking and and these different ways of um, deploying very low numbers of actual decoy servers and and full blown uh, honeypot systems when necessary um, to keep the 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 infrastructure uh, actually pretty small and yet um, make it available to broad swaths of the network. Um, it, it has been a, a, a huge advancement in the space. Um, you know, again, the the scale of the thing um, has to be, you know, both broad, wide, and deep in order to be in order to be effective. And again, no one has the no one has the time to to manage that infrastructure. So, you know, at Elusive, we use a, a, a simple process of just you know deploying our application on top of you know your uh, customers' existing uh, server images. Um, and then use their virtualization structure to uh, deploy those hosts in a logical fashion. And, and we can get into more of that, you know, at, a, at another time. But the idea is very low overhead uh, for administration with high believability. Uh, absolutely, absolutely essential. And then uh, obviously there's there's reporting, um, alerting, there's, there's orchestration that will take place. But, you know, I think another interesting component of this is some of the forensic capabilities that, that, I, that, that it has, too. Yeah, and and look, we got really excited about this on the elusive side when we shifted our method kind of um, away from relying so much on the honeypot, right? I mean, a honeypot continues to be a a difficult proposition, right? Um, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna uh, convince someone that this environment is real, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of effort, um, and what we find is that sophisticated attackers are able to see through a lot of that. So at Elusive, we made a shift to gathering forensics directly from the production system, right? I don't, I don't really need to lure you into a honeypot and get you to do something interesting if, in fact, I can just pull forensics right off of the source, the production system that you're working from, um, and and uh, present that information into the uh, into the uh, security operations team. Um, you know, in a way that is easily consumable and automated. So, so people get pretty excited about this uh, from the elusive approach, pulling, you know, on-demand forensics right off of the source of the attack, rather than trying to get someone to do something interesting in a honeypot. You're already doing something interesting on the production host. Let's just yeah. start right there. And it's, uh, it's extremely compelling. That, that's interesting. Yep, very much so. Um, for sure, for, you know, this is a compelling technology. There's no doubt about it. Um, the, you, you sort of brought up a point of being able to detect what your adversary is doing. And, and in a way, you know, I, it, it's one of those things where we, I've been in a number of situations where we've detected adversary movement and decided not to block at the time. We were waiting for new technology to come on and deploy. It was in you know, process and it was a few months out and we said, you know, don't actually do anything that would tip the attacker off that we see them yet. Let's wait before we paint them into a corner to block them off. And once we do that, then we can watch them when we're really ready. So we actually kind of just watched, it was a scan basically, but we just kept an eye on this particular scan and that somebody thought we were interesting. And then as soon as our new technology was ready, we turned it on and blocked the scan and actually did, I, I do believe uh, you know, defeated this this attack, but our concern was we wanted to understand what our adversaries were capable of, and not show them what we knew or didn't know. And I feel like that is a point that gets missed a lot in security operations centers. Often it's very much just act, just act, and it really sounds like deception gives you the ability to paint a picture for your adversary of, of what you want him to see, which is a, very interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's really changed the 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 capability and the, the whole dynamic of interacting with with an attacker, right? And so, and you know, 
being being passive at some point is just is just a, a, a real problem for us as a security team. We're supposed to be you know becoming proactive, mm -hmm. um, and and we we find this you know attackers get presence in the environment and without a deception platform, every th single thing that they see and learn is real and true and reusable next time. Right. I mean, when an attacker gets presence, you know, we either detect them early or we detect them late. But, you know, at some point they get detected and they get punted. And so everything that happens in between for them is real and reusable. Right. They understand what our uh, Active Directory infrastructure is. They learn about our uh, networking and segmentation approach. They learn about our detection capabilities. They learn about our endpoint controls. They learn about, you know, they learn about all of our capabilities. And then next time they get presence, all of the information that they learned last time is all reusable. And so with a modern deception capability, we're actually in a position to provide a continuous stream of disinformation to that attacker. When they get a beachhead in the environment, we deceive them with data so that they can't be confident in what they learn from our environment. Some of the information they gather is real, and and uh, and but the majority of the data that they gather from the environment is is actually deceptive in nature. Right. Um, and if this is done correctly, it really burns the attacker's time. Right. We're using fundamentally an automated deception infrastructure to push the attacker into a manual process. And those guys have been pushing, those guys have been using automated processes to push the security teams into manual processes for a long, long time. And it's yeah. really only a deception play, which allows us to turn the tables on them um, and feed them this, this disinformation, which, which really in in increases the cost of the attack. Well, one of the things when, you know, we talked about too, was the ability to quickly detect patient zero, which is always, you know, again, that's a bit of the holy grail is to know when the first machine was infected and how did this start, right? I mean, that's always the, the, the end of any forensic investigation is how did it start? Um, you know, one of the things I, about, I think, deception too, that is very compelling is the ability to quickly detect uh, when someone is on the environment. And I mean, I think that's, that's pretty big for, for, for security teams. Well, it's, it's huge, right? But what we tell people is, listen, if you want to detect on patient zero, you have to be on patient zero, right? So again, kind of our traditional, uh, you know, kind of legacy deception methodology is kind of honeypot centric. I mean, your, your honeypot is not patient zero ever, yeah. right? You know, that's not where they're starting. So if you think about it, if you're going to detect on patient zero, your deception campaign needs to focus on patient zero. That's where the majority of your deception work needs to take place. And so this is the approach we've taken at Elusive is to really look at the data on the production workstations and servers, because we don't know where the attacker is going to land, and to, to manipulate that data, to add deceptive credential and connection strings, and to continuously maintain that information in an automated way. So it kind of doesn't matter where the attacker lands, they're landing in a modified environment where we control the story. Um, and you know, the, the chances of an attacker every single time picking both a real credential and a real connection string uh, to try to move laterally is, uh, is you know, it's just not going to happen. And so yeah. this, is, this is how we've really changed the game on, on you know, patient zero detection. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's an interesting point. You know, we, you know we, we talked about, we say no false positives, but it's very, I mean, maybe no is a bit of a stretch, but it is there's almost no false positives. Or certainly, you know, when I think about the number of alerts that the standard um, security monitoring tool, but name it, it could be anything, what, you know, it throws off. It's a staggering number of alerts and events that need correlating. Um, the number of alerts, really, it only happens, you know, the only way someone's getting to one of these machines or running a connection string is if they did something nefarious to get it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, yeah, you know, the no false positives moniker is probably a little aggressive. It's certainly extremely low. I, I will say this, <clears throat> the, way, the way we use the method today, the deceptive data that we plant, you pretty much have to violate policy to see that data, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, look, you're doing something you shouldn't do even to get access to the information. And then, um, we don't, you know, we don't run an agent. So it's not until you actually use the data that I've planted that we have a detection event. Mm -hmm. So, 
I mean, honestly, you know, some of the quote unquote false positives we see will be, you know, someone will send a security person in their organization to a SANS Institute training. You know, they spend a, you know, three days doing ethical hacking and they come back and they start, you know, digging through their system and, you know, technically violating policy, but you know, yeah. and then they, they find some objects and go looking around and, you know, the alarms yeah. go off and say, hey, this guy's, you know, doing something he shouldn't. Now, is that actually a false positive or, I mean, I mean, maybe so, you know, we, we, I mean, it's, it definitely, a little bit. yeah, it comes down to that, you know, uh, it, it's illegal. It's, it's okay to have the thing. It's illegal to sell the thing or buy the thing, you know, it's like, if you right. have memory, it's like, okay, well, that's against policy. But now if you do something with it, it becomes a much more serious event. Um, so yeah. and, and the other thing I, I thought was compelling, and you did talk about it a little bit, was the you know the the ability to pull from AD on an event or on something that seems suspicious. So I, in my mind, I would think an example of that is uh, you know on the machines on on in the breadcrumbs on the lures, I have a, a phony username and password string, and I don't actually have that user on my domain controller. But if something connects to a legitimate domain controller and asks for that user and you know sends a, sends a hash along that would, would trigger an event, right? Oh, absolutely. And that's a, you know, that's a classic methodology and it's extremely effective against the insider, right? And, and this becomes a, you know, look, I've been in a lot of deception campaigns for a lot of years and it's, it is extremely difficult to, to deploy uh, honeypots in a way that is going to get at an insider. Because an insider, I know where I'm going. I know exactly the systems I'm trying to get at and the data I'm trying to get at, the production systems. I just don't have the credentials to get there, right? And so, you know, par part of what we do at Elusive by, by planting what appear to be privileged credentials um, that are all different levels of realism, uh, you know, gives the insider the opportunity to go leverage those credentials after they've harvested them um, an attempt to gain access to a production asset. And, and again, we'll, we'll detect that event because of the use of the deceptive credential. Um, it's extremely effective. However, it's hard to do in a believable way, right? It's hard to place credentials in the environment in a way that's very believable and, and lure the person into actually taking a swing. I've seen a lot of other uh, homegrown uh, credential planting methods that, you know, honestly, yes, technically there's a deceptive credential on the production host, but you know, other than a script kitty, I don't, I don't think anybody's gonna, you know, gonna fall for the fact that that's, uh, that's a real object. So even, even just maintaining, you know, I mean, the care and feeding of even that is, I can, you know, I can see that getting stale and 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 not working in a few months unless it has a lot of attention behind it, right? Unless it's a full blown solution and not just, you know, absolutely. Right? Look, look, good deception is storytelling. It's storytelling. You have to, you can't just drop objects out there, right? You know. You have yeah. to tell stories that are believable. And I used to tell this to people that were, you know, new to deception campaigning that, you know, over and over the mantra is time stamps matter, you know, yeah. time stamps matter, right? I mean, it, you know, some things ought to be old, some things need to be fresh and new. And, you know, if everything that I do on this particular production host, by the way of planting deceptive data, all happens in the environment at the same time, you know, three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, you know, that's just not, yeah. you know, that's yeah. not, you know, yes, you can check a box and say, I've got deceptive data out there, but it's probably not going to, you know, it's not going to. Well, I mean, it's an interesting thing, you know, as this, you know, as we talk about this, it's really clear there's sort of more, you know, it's not just about a honeypot, right? It is, it's about a, a, a honey net, I think is the, the descriptor you use, but also it's the story, it's the endpoints and the, the lures. So it's really these sort of two major components the machines that will actually interact with the user and the ability to convince the user to interact with the machines in a way that doesn't wreak havoc on the network, right? It's two real right. separate components. Right, and, and, and look, Simon, what, what you have to do is get beyond the data of the, you know, the deceptive data that you plant and your, your, your traps and decoys that do the detection work, right? You, you have to get beyond the infrastructure to the story. Right. One of the things that we do, like you, you look at how my personal laptop is used. Right. And so, you know, I've got Notepad++ and Putty and WinSCP and other tools like that. And so, you know, a good deceptive story on my system would include behaviors where I have used administrative applications to interact with honeypots. Right. Mm -hmm. So that when someone, if an attacker gets access to my system, what they see is a story where I'm doing administrative work 
using the deceptive environment. But as a user, I don't, I don't see those objects in history, right? So it's a believable story. Um, and this is this has kind of been the holy grail of automation for deception and and what we're so excited about uh, 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 that makes it game changing for security teams. Yeah, I think one of the side effects, right? So that the big major components, the honey nets, the systems that will actually interact and be the decoys and the ability to tell the story and to create a narrative to get somebody convinced to go do stuff based on you know deceptive credentials or machines. You know, one of the things that is a side effect of that then becomes infrastructure awareness and how users interact with data and systems, which is a very, I think, compelling component of this technology as well. Well, absolutely. And this whole infrastructure awareness and crown jewel, you know, element is really essential. You know, back in the day, uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to have a bunch of honeypots, right? I mean, it, 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 it can be a bunch of work. And so, and there's licensing costs and, you know, even if you buy an automated system. And so we tended to put, uh, uh, you know, deceptive hosts around crown jewel systems. Well, it's even hard to identify where the crown jewels are for a lot of organizations, you know, with a huge environment, you know, what's, what's important to who can, can be hard to discover. So um, plus, not to mention that, but, you know, there was some times back when we clearly saw, you know, attacker behavior and we've interviewed some people and you realize that, you know, an attacker would identify a honeypot and he would say to himself, hey, I know I'm getting close, right? That's clearly a, a, a fake host. I must be next to something good. So, you know, you have to be careful how you do this so you don't lure people towards sensitive systems. For but sure. one of the things that, that Elusive does with our method, because we're examining production data, and it's the only way to do it, in my opinion. You have to use the actual data about how this enterprise operates, how do users interact with other hosts, uh, what times a day do they go where, what kind of applications do they use. You know, and as, at Elusive, we actually monitor and mine that data to create our deceptive stories. Well, one of the outcomes of that is this infrastructure awareness and this crown jewel detection that we kind of do in an automated fashion and start showing to people, hey, this these systems appear to be sensitive you know this host you've got 400 people a day rdping in and out of it for short sessions and it, are you sure that's not a crown jewel right that seems important yeah um, and it and it really opens the eyes of of a lot of security teams and infrastructure teams about who's going where and when in their environment what kind of protocols are in use um, right. and we've got some great visualization on that i mean yes that information is in logs in the sim someplace but uh, you know it's kind of hard to kind of hard to, to look through well, that i mean you know somebody had a question about ransomware and and how you know and the effectiveness and how this would prevent that sort of thing and to me it feels very much like you know there's there's a notion of i i have to back up my infrastructure so that if something does decide to encrypt all of it, I can restore. But at the same time, you know, at what rate do I restore and which systems do I restore first? Like having the answer to that would be very useful. And what are the things that need backups, you know, incrementally all the time? And what are things that are okay to backup once a month? Like, I feel like if you have this awareness about, you know, not just where your domain controllers are, but like you said, who's who, what machine are people RDPing to all the time and what machine is getting one connection a week or just doing outbound internet connections and serving static pages or that is a proxy for something else that could easily be replicated and rebuilt. Like being able to identify where the sensitive data lives is, you know, or, or drawing a, a bubble around a group of people and saying these people have lots of access or have the need to work with sensitive information. You know, we need to know where they go routinely so that in the event of a ransomware attack, for example, you can restore the most important things the most rapidly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that that kind of and it goes into everything right about how to how to do backups, how to do privileged account management. Right. We go into environments all the time where people are running, you know, privileged account management. Um, and then we're actually going out and auditing the effectiveness of that and saying, yeah, but these accounts over here are not being managed by your you know, PAM or or by AM platform. Uh, you know, what are you doing about local administrative accounts? I mean, there's a there's a, a huge pain and pressure there. You know, Elusive certainly has a, uh, a a ransomware module that 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 can be deployed to to uh, intercept and interact with uh, with ransomware uh, as it goes through its encryption process, and so that that that's another side effect of of, of what we do is is uh, you know tar pitting some of that behavior while we can uh, stomp on it. Um, so yeah, it's certainly an advantage that we can that we can bring into the space. 
Um, for sure. I mean, I think it, this, it's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, this is this is a, a pretty. It's a. I think it's a very compelling technology, but there's there's like a lot of parts that make it um, make it so compelling. But but also the automation and the sort of the having it all kind of done for you. And to your point, you know, the right time steps, being able to have the right narrative running through your systems to understand the crown jewels, where they live, how users interact with data. You know, I mean, really, for the most part. Prior to this technology, to me, it feels like this is so challenging because a lot of this is really, you're just hoping you know this stuff. I think your point, you go into an environment, there's a whole bunch of accounts that aren't being, you know, they're privileged that aren't being managed or, you know, we didn't know that people were already peeing to this machine all the time. And it's, there's a lot of, I think, hope in, in security teams that rely on, I, I think this is where the, you know, this is where the quarterly numbers live that the CFO gets, but you know, do they live in other places? Where does the CFO, how do they deal with it? Like, I think in a lot of cases, there's a lot of hope and static maps about topology that, that we come to rely on as security teams. Yeah, and one thing, you know, Elusive, you know, we're really different in the space. You know, as a company, you know, our founders are not security people. They're nation state red team threat actors, right? That spent years and years and years in government service doing red team work uh, you know, for their respective governments, right? And so when you bring that attacker perspective to the, to the fight, you realize that, you know, security people think very differently than attackers do, right? And the, the attacker doesn't look at our environments based on our mapping. They look at it more like a social network, right? Where can I go? Who can I interact with? Uh, you know, what can, I, what can get I, I get access to? So the whole static mapping idea um, is something that, that you know attackers are very very uh, adept at leveraging the blind spots um i'll say one more thing uh, about detection I, I think one of the challenges that we've had in the deception space over the years is that you, you have to decide what your use cases are and what you're trying to accomplish with your deception campaigns and with your deception infrastructure um, the threat intelligence company companies have been leveraging large, huge honey nets for decades now to yeah. gather deceptive information because it's a threat intelligence use case, right? So you put these massive honey nets out there on the web and let people, you know, chew them all to pieces and uh, pull information about, you know, indicators of compromise and attacker methodologies, you know, out, out of those environments. And so huge, you know, honey net platforms make perfect sense for, for that methodology. The, the, the problem for, you know, most security teams is most security teams are more concerned about adversary detection, right, than really a lot of threat intelligence coming out of that. They certainly want all the threat intelligence they can get. Um, but look, you're, you're not getting any threat intelligence if you don't get detection. Right. No detection, no threat intelligence. So you really yeah. have to solve the detection problem first. And this is what makes it so challenging is that if you don't do good detection, you won't get any threat intelligence. So at Elusive, we're totally focused on endpoint zero. Right. How do we do excellent deception on the beachhead where the attacker is going to land? And if you do it right there, not only do you get high speed detection, but then you also get the threat intelligence you're, that you're looking for because you can pull it right out of the production environment and kind of reduce that pressure on having, uh, you know, lots and lots of honeypots that are, you know, right, constantly being updated and uh, and, and telling stories. So right. we're pretty excited about that as a way to to overcome some of those challenges. But I feel like it's that it's two sides of the story. It's the endpoint patient zero detection. Here we can actually get to this slide because I think it it kind of helps. We'll talk through kind of how we deploy this and you know what does it really look like. But to start out on the endpoints, it's the you know how can I create a narrative on every endpoint or you know potentially I have an HR sort of narrative. I have a sales narrative. I have a you know, a finance narrative, I have a developer narrative, um, you know, and, and you, you deploy these narratives to the appropriate endpoints so that your story to an attacker looks very legitimate and, and sane and sound. And then, you know, the ability you get to get, if you have really good threat intel and you detect patient zero, then ideally the TTPs are going to be clear and you'll know where that, where that attacker is going next and you, you wind up with an upper hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But 
but I, th I think you, you pointed out, Simon, it all starts with what's happening on the endpoints, right? It all starts with understanding how do users use those systems, where credentials, you know, what kind of uh, Active Directory or you know other, other LDAP structures are they using for authentication, what data is available. Um, and you use that data, I mean, we use that data to deploy a continuously changing uh, deceptive story, which is incredibly compelling because it looks so real. So like for one example, you know, on my laptop, maybe I'm using Chrome today um, and Elusive tells a deception story on my host that leverages Chrome because that's the browser that I use. But tomorrow, if I shift over and start using Opera, your deception story needs to shift gears with me. Right, and it needs to do that automatically and at scale all throughout in the environment so that the deployment, you know, the traffic, the usage, the target systems all have to adapt to those changes kind of in an automatic fashion. And, and when you do that, what we found is that we do get the kind of alerting and detection that we're looking for. What has been so surprising to us um, is that we've seen nearly a 50-50 split between insider methodology and external threat actors. And one of the reasons we've been able to derive that is because our forensics collection comes directly from the source machine, right? I mean, right down to including the screenshots off of the source host where this attacker is operating from and interacting with our, with our decoys. And so this kind of visualiz visualization shows you, you know, if the, if the guy is doing it in his browser, it's it's the user, right? If it's a suppressed process running in the background, it's you know most likely a uh, a, a malware variant that's that's operating, right? And so um, we've been pretty excited about this methodology. It's it's extremely effective and uh, and uh, yeah, it's it, it's working really well. Interesting. So my, I guess that is a, when we talk about actual deployment. I understand different different. Um, there are different methodologies for deploying lures to endpoints. You guys, as I understand it, use a binary that is that is created and built and dropped on the endpoint, executed, and then basically dissolves, and, and that leaves the remnants of, you know, whatever the, the story or the narrative you're trying to convince the attacker to go for, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's been super, super effective for us. Um, the the dissolvable binary, as opposed to as opposed to an agent, it's a it's a different approach in the security space. We spent a lot of time talking about it with our with our customers. Um, they they love it because there's no continuous overhead on the endpoints themselves. Um, we we drop the binary onto the endpoint. It typical runtime is two to three hundred milliseconds, and then it's gone. Um, and what's left behind is, is uh, manipulated data. And we're also removing data. There's some cleaning in the process. We're simply removing credential and connection string data that doesn't need to be there, denying the attacker their best fuel and also making the deceptive uh, you know, information more, more appealing. Um, and, and, and the idea behind this is that without an agent um, and we're working at the at the underlying data layer. It doesn't matter what tools an attacker brings to the fight, because we're working at the data layer, right? So, so if I've if I've manipulated the credentials in the memory of a host, I don't really care if the attacker scrapes that hash using you know Mini Cats or some homegrown memory scraper or Windows credential editor. Right? It doesn't matter what application they bring to the fight because we've, what we've done is taken it down to the data layer um, and it's, it, it's an extremely effective method. And then of course, there's no, there's no operational you know, overhead on the system from having a, from having a binary, which you know, IT groups love. Right, so uh, you could emulate a system account that wouldn't 2FA in, it would just be like a backup process that would potentially be dumped out of memory. And, and when, so my, one of the things I also like too, so what happens with companies that you work with customers that don't have GPO installed, don't have a, a solid um, AD uh, infrastructure to deploy these. How, how else are these binaries pushed? Well, the, what, what's what's easy about the system is you can use anything to push it, right? And so um, it's a it's an EXE with an initialization string. So you know it runs. You know you can use uh, WMI or PS Exec, uh, SCCM in a in an AD environment. Uh, Titanium, big fix, Altiris, it doesn't matter, right? Any infrastructure that can push a binary out to an endpoint and kick it off is all you need. And it's it's simplistic because 
it's a sensor run. It's not an installation package, right? So there's not all the classic overhead of running an install. And, you know, our, our binary doesn't do any uh, direct memory access. There's no kernel shimming or memory hooking or any of that kind of stuff, you know. We're just using OS API calls to, to query the endpoint for data, just like an attacker would. Um, clean it up where necessary, and then and then plant the deceptive information. Um, and so, um, it, and, and, and it takes advantage of whatever infrastructure it sees, right? I mean, we're dealing with authentication at a lot of different levels, right? So we've got uh, Active Directory as one way. Maybe people are using a privilege account management, like a like a CyberArk platform, and, and and we work with that as well. We work with the local security database, right? So local credentialing, and and again, this is where the system automatically looks at what's happening in the environment and then adapts the deception story to match that approach, which is what makes it great because most, you know, enterprises have different approaches in different spaces and, you know, no one's lining up to, to want to do the work of, of customizing that manually. You know, the, the platform has to take care of that, that all on its own. Yeah. So let's go over um, the elusive networks. I mean, we sort of talked a bit, you know, broadly, I think, about the technology. You brought up a few distinctions for elusive, but, you know, broadly speaking, we've talked, of, you know, about the space, but I'm interested to get into, you know, I think we, we have had a, a good discussion about it, but tell us now a little bit more about your sort of the specifics of, of the platform that you guys bring. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> what we've we've done is is broken the capability into into three kind of logical buckets um there's a preemption capability called attack surface manager um and, and what this what we realize is look you know attackers move laterally a lot of times based on the credential and connection data that, it, that they find on a production host um, and so the best way to to handle this in an environment is to is to manage that surface and <clears throat> use some automated infrastructure like elusive attack surface manager to simply clean privileged credential and connection strings from the environment that do not need to be there right and you know red team exercises and attackers just they just leverage that kind of information constantly so um it's it's a very exciting capability it's a, it's newer for us just just about a year old now um and it's and it's really revolutionizing the way that people think about the attack surface not just being vulnerabilities in the operating system and in application layer but also credential and connection data that exists out in the environment and and one of the things about this is you know folks have you know different tools to try and manage let's say credentials right and so maybe you're using ad gpos to manage credentials you're using a, a, a pam solution um, you know, maybe laps for Windows 10 local administrator accounts and whatnot. But but what solution do you have that's auditing the effectiveness of those platforms, actually looking at the production environment and cleaning that information? That's Attack Surface Manager, hugely effective. Um, and that's kind of, that's a standalone product. The other side of the capability is the detection and intelligence platform where we use the data that we collected scanning the systems to automatically build and tell a deception story that we deploy and maintain on the production environment. Um, it's extremely effective. We get into red team exercises with, with nation state uh, level you know, folks from everybody from the NSA to Mandiant to Microsoft and Cisco and on and on and on. And, and we, you know, we've never lost you know, any of those exercises because it's, it's just mathematically, I mean, I won't say impossible, but it's really difficult to move in an environment where Elusive has done this work you know, without being detected. The response is super exciting because we pull the forensics directly from the source machine. Obviously, we, correct, you know, we collect intelligence from our decoys and trap systems as well. Um, but but getting it from the source of the behavior really accelerates the the time to response for for our customers. Um, we talked about these other elements. The integration, I think I'll just mention that last point. The integration into the security infrastructure uh, is really essential, right? In that you know what we do at Elusive is not a standalone platform. It's tied into your uh, exist existing LDAP capability. It's tied into your privilege account management. It's tied into your um, SIM platform and your incident response and leveraging uh, EDR and other tools or SOAR platform for automated response. Um, and it's 
and that's one of the things that, that customers like about it is it's not a standalone tool. It doesn't require a whole bunch of hand holding and love. Uh, we come in and set it up, and then it 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 pretty much runs and does its thing. Uh, the, the automation has been has been critical to the success uh, you know, of the platform. For sure, yeah. Um, um, I think the uh, it's an we it's a couple of use cases here. We can just talk through a few of them, and then uh, we can talk a little bit about um, some of the specifics and some of the you know the tales from the shadows, and specifically attack detection. But like typical use cases here right, would be for APT protection, lateral movement, all the sorts of things that, you know, I think somebody would normally think of. A, a differentiator that I, I want to kind of hear, because I heard you talk about it, but I'm still a little fuzzy. You know, you said that there is a clear distinction between insider behavior and somebody who's coming in from the outside and gets a beachhead. Um, what, like, can you talk a little bit about that and what, what sorts of things, and, and sort of not just the specific, in the details of the differences, but how you guys were able to kind of pull those apart and understand an insider from an external uh, attack. Right, right. And so this is, this is great. Um, this is a great discussion because I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of interest, you know, I think the awareness around the, the threat that insiders and, you know, look, an insider could be a, it could be a vendor partner, it could be a contractor, it could be an employee. I mean, there's, there's lots of people that we provide access into our environment. Um, but, but it's hard to differentiate the, the typically with typical security tools, very hard to differentiate um, in a lot of cases between the insider and the external threat actor. Um, now, obviously when you see some ransomware object, you know, blasting through endpoints and, and jumping through SMB connections, you know, you, you're pretty obvious that that's, you know, that that's, a, that's an external threat actor. But um, one of the things that Elusive does is in our storytelling, we, uh, we, we provide the insider with options. You know, we understand insider behavior. Um, there's, I, I will talk about this insider threat uh, hit, um, tale from the shadows that we had. You know, we, found a money laundering campaign in operation between an employee and a supervisor. And they've been running this for 22 months. Um, <clears throat> we were able to detect this because what Elusive does automatically <clears throat> is present juicy, what appear to be juicy opportunities to an insider that are just kind of too much to resist, right? We know what insiders are looking for. And so, based on the kind of deception objects that they use and the way that they interact with uh, production, other production assets, you get a pretty good indication that this is, that this is insider behavior. Um, and our customers, honestly, you know, pretty, pretty excited about that as a capability. Uh, obviously, straight up attack detection here, um, you know, finding nation state level attackers that have been operating for, for months and months, you know, can be can be difficult to do. Um, we've been successful in in that space uh, a lot. But then also the cyber hygiene, I guess, is the one last the one last thing I think we ought to mention. When we examine environments for the credential and connection strings that are out there, um, you know, four thousand machines, and amongst that were two hundred and twenty persistent connections into Crown Jewel host that they're we couldn't find any value for them, right? There was no use case that justified those connections. That's a lot of opportunities for exploitation uh, in, in, in the environment. So um, we think that these use cases are, 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 are pretty compelling, um, both from an external threat actor and an internal threat actor, and then just flat out denial. Uh, it's really changing the game of how a, how a, a platform like ours can can uh, speed things up for uh, security teams. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. You know, it really is this. It's sort of an inverted. You know, I think about insider threat. I have a couple of different sort of lenses when I analyze it. In some cases, you know, it, it's it really it comes down to motivation and what is the intention. Uh, because I think you know technically, any account that's compromised, whether it's internal or external, somebody's using what were what are legitimate credentials to connect to a domain controller they're using a domain admin to get to a domain controller and that's a legitimate pair of that's a, that's a legitimate connection uh, sorry a legitimate credential set used illegitimately or the intent is different or maybe it's the real domain admin doing something he shouldn't be or she shouldn't be doing like what it's really like understanding the intention of 
what is happening on the machine. And because, you know, part of the craft of this that you guys have, have deployed is you need to be able to tell the story. And so in order to build the narrative, you need to understand what's happening. And, and that in turn, because you're able to understand, like in this case, you know, this 220 connections to Crown Jewel systems persistently, you're able to understand like more of what the intention is and what good and bad really look like and should be. Um, and I think that's, that's again, why I keep saying that this is um, super compelling technology. Um, we have a poll too, which I think we're gonna get to, um, which should be interesting. And you know, when you and I were talking, I was kind of saving this for last. I hope people hung around because this is one of my sort of favorite things. We talked, you sort of said like, I'm interested to hear about how people talk to, uh, you know, to management, to, to exec staff, how, how do you go about getting budget for this thing? And what are the concerns? And concern can be, you know, I'm really excited about it, but I, I want to explain it to you. And how do you go about getting uh, to, you know, a budget a line item for this thing? And I think that you, the story you gave me, honestly, I think it's, uh, you know, we have, use it to detect red teams quickly. I mean, I, tell me about that, because I could see this being really valuable and interesting to people listening. Yeah, one of the <clears throat> one of the stories that that people tell us all the time is, look, the modern security team, you, you, you got a bunch of very professional, hardworking people that are that are really trying to make a difference. And and part of that discipline is uh, red teams, whether it's an internal red team exercise or a third party that you're bringing in at a cadence. And we've had a lot of customers come back and say, man, these red team exercises, first of all, they're killing us. Um, these guys move effectively through our environments and really got egg on our face because of the effectiveness of the red team exercises. And then the second comment is, you know, and the look, the board members and 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 other C-level executives are, you know, they don't understand. It's like, I don't understand why I'm spending all this money on cybersecurity and these red teams come in and just walk through our environments in very short order. It, it, the whole thing seems kind of pointless. Um, and that's a huge frustration for, for security teams. I, I think the second thing that we find is that what comes out of these red teams exercises are huge lists of things that need to be cleared up. You know, you need to clean this, you need to clean this, you need to fix this, you need to do these things. And for a lot, in a lot of organizations, that's not optional, right? When that red team, third party red team report comes out, you have to address all of those, you know, management expects that to be handled uh, sometimes in short order. And, right. and in a lot of cases, the security team is aware of other priorities. It's like, yeah, some of that's kind of an issue, but it might be a lot of work to fix one of those objects on that list that's really only of a limited benefit, right? And the security team has a better idea. So with Elusive, one of the values we've provided is that our customers are able to uh, stop red teams from being effective in their environment and really provide a lot of confidence to management that the security team is in a position to detect when someone has access to the environment, yep. but also to stop getting these horrible lists that require, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, a bunch of work without yep. a whole lot of value. So that's been an exciting part of the of the solution. Yeah, yeah I think uh, I think for sure. I mean, that's you definitely you suddenly you get a whole new uh, business plan when when that happens. And I think being able to throw technology like this at it and immediately kind of detect it. I think we got you know most of the poll results back, so I think we can uh, we'll go see them here. So it is pretty it's evenly split. Um, peer recommendations and confusing adversary about topology connectivity tool reuse, exposing data flows. Um, I, I think. All of these are super valid. And actually, the fact that it is evenly split to me feels like it's right on because I think they're all super valuable as part of this uh, this technology. Um, I think we'll go to the, you know, any more uh, questions, sort of Q&A. Um, uh, I think we, we got to most of the questions here. I think there was, you know, one about, um, you know, sort of managing credentials uh, and keeping them locked, you know, for system accounts, I, th I think the question had to do with 2FA. And I think, you know, can you just have your credentials behind 2FA? Uh, yes, you can, but I think there's system accounts that won't be able to use a second factor that are going to just have to connect to systems like sort of backups. So I hope that answers that question. And I think somebody had asked, I think we got to it too a little bit about uh, specifically, um, ransomware and dealing with it and i think uh it's also very compelling that if ransomware is a concern one of the things this will highlight is where those crown jewels are so i think i, I feel like the way this was a really good conversation and 
Um, I'm really glad you could join us and, and help sort of explain this and some of the history behind this technology. Absolutely, Simon. Thanks. And we really enjoy uh, the time and, and thanks for inviting us out. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, have a look for our, um, our landscape paper about the deception technology and feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, thank you again. Bye.